morning we have uh, our pastor Ilin, Ilin Po and a mighty anointed teacher and a preacher of the word of God. We welcome you. Okay, sound check. Am I on? Okay, very good morning to everyone here. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be back here to share with you the gospel and uh, uh, God's word. You know, before we look into the Bible, you know, shall we just bow for a word of prayer? Father, we thank you for this morning, for the opportunity that we can gather together to read your word, to learn from your word. I pray for all my brothers and sisters who are sitting here in your midst. We thank you, God, that you are in our midst and in your, in, we are in your presence. I pray right now that even... I sense that even as I was sitting there, there's some of you here who have came in with a headache, you know, it's the back of your neck and it's causing the strain all, the, all down your, uh, your, your back of your head up to your neck. Father, I pray for the brother and sister who has this uh, headache that's constant, uh, resulted in a neck pain. In the name of Jesus, we thank you, God, for this revelation that you will begin to touch the person right now. That whatever pain, whatever discomfort in the name of Jesus, you begin to go away, be lifted from the person, that you loosen every muscles, every tissue. In Jesus' name we pray. And God's people will say, Amen. Amen. So this morning, you know, if you later on, if you have a testimony, please feel free to share with a fellow church elder or leader. But you know, this morning today, I want to share with you about God's love. Now, how many of you uh, belong to a family? It should be everyone, right? If not, we won't be here, isn't it? So all of us here belong to a family. And all of us here are part of a family, whether it's a nuclear family, extended family, or the family of God. And so because all of us be, belong to a family and, and have a family, today I want to share with you a topic about a family series. And I will kick off by talking about being caught by God's love to love others. Okay, and the opening activity is we're going to do this activity and I'm going to ask you to maybe just stand up. Okay, you've been sitting for a while now. So I'm going to ask you to put all your things down, stand up. And this is what I want you to do is point your right finger upwards. Okay, and then your left palm, you know, on your left hand, just put it upwards facing the ceiling, okay? Okay, very good. Now I want you to put one finger on your neighbor's palm, left palm. You got that? Put your finger on your neighbor's left palm. So all of you should be all linked up and joined together. Now, we're going to do a very simple activity here. And I'm going to read you a passage from the book of 1 John. Okay, when I read the book of, the book of 1 John, and whenever you hear the word love, okay, you need to catch your partner's finger. And where you make sure that your finger is not caught by the other person. You got that? Let's see how sharp you are this morning. Okay, are you ready? So let's start. Beloved. <laughs> let us love one another. Okay, don't flash that, okay? They can look at it. Don't flash that. Okay. Let us, for love is of God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love, does not love God, know God, for God is love. Now in this, the love of God was manifested towards us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. And this is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation of our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Test of reflexes, okay? It's good training. Now, no one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us. And His love has been perfected in us. By this, we know that we abide in Him and Him in us because He has given us His Spirit. 
And we have seen and testified that God has sent the Son as Saviour of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him and He is in God. And we have known and believed that love that God has for us, God is love. And He who abides in love, abides in God and God in Him. Now give yourself a hand, shall we? Well, thank you for being so sporting this morning. So how many of you got caught more than one time? Okay, how many of you got caught more than five times? Anybody ten times? All the time? Okay, so today I want to share with you a very simple message, but I think it's simple to share, but it's difficult to live it out on a daily basis. So the message I want to share with you is called by love. For those who have not met me before, uh, my name is Elin. Okay, so by training, I've actually, uh, I spent uh, 20 years in pastoral ministries. And thereafter, right now, I'm actually a social worker. So I work in the neighborhoods in the West. I serve the families living in the Bukit Batok, Bukit Panjang, Chachukang region. So what we do is we run programs for families, including some of the low-income families. So this is what I do at the moment. So um, I still... I still hold credentials in Assemblies of God, but that is my primary uh, work at the moment. So today I want to share with you something that's was on my heart and that's why God called me out from uh, working in a church into the community to serve the needs out there and I believe that this message would be a message that I pray you will find applicable in your own life and in your own family as well. So the, in the next slide... Okay, today's passage as what you have experienced is about love. And all of you have been caught by love at least once. And that's why we are here. And so in the third, in the move on to the next slide, okay, I want to share with you about Harvard study. There was a study that was done in Harvard. Okay, it was a 75-year study. How many of you are 75 years old here? One. Wow. Dr. Chan, yeah, you know. So in a 75-year study in the next slide that they did about, and they followed men across a lifespan where they wanted to find out, you know, what was it that contributed to happiness, longevity, and a meaningful life. So there was a study that was done over 75 years, and the secret they found that people who live a fulfilled, meaningful life, besides asking Dr. Chan, Okay, from this book, it talks about how, you know, the good life is built with good relationships. And what are good relationships? Good relationships refer to high-quality social and family connections cultivated in the atmosphere of love. You know, having a thousand followers or more than a million followers on Instagram or Facebook doesn't necessarily mean I have a good life. How many can say Amen. Yeah, you know, love has, is the strongest force, driving force, because numerous songs, books, poems have been written about love. Just how you know, just look at the Taylor Swift concert, sold out, right? You know, any, every great artist, whether it's a singer, artist, you know, they sing about love. And this is why love has everything to do with our physical, emotional, and mental well-being. It's an essential part of being. And so whether you are single, married, young or old, we all need to be loved and love someone. The Bible has much to say about love. In fact, Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 to 39 tells us this. It says that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And this is the greatest commandment. Now the second commandment, it goes like this. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. I'm sure many of you here have heard sermons Great messages encouraging us to love God and love people. But how many of you can identify with me that sometimes we have to force ourselves? We have to say things like, you know, I have to try harder. Maybe if my spouse needs my forgiveness and love, I don't know how, but I just have to do it. I just have to give it. Okay, if, you know, it can sound like this. I don't care how much it hurts, but I have to be kind to the person or to be nice to the person that I don't really like. You know, or my teenager is driving me up the wall, but I will continue to love her although it's torturing me on the inside. So we clench our teeth and then we resolve in the heart, I'm going to love although it kills me. But what, have, what are we missing here? 
Is there something that we are missing in the process? Dr. John Gothman wrote a book and it was one of the books that we use as we support uh, couples in the community, you know, when, when they come to us and they say they want to get married or they uh, needed some help in their relationships. He wrote a book called, the, and he named the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. Sounds like the book from the book of Revelations. He says this, that there are four things that actually destroys relationships. There are four things that tears relationships apart. The first one is called criticism. You know, when we criticize something, it causes fracture in relationships. The second one is called contempt. When you speak to someone and the person reply you with contempt or, dis or disdain, it also causes fissures in relationships. The third is stonewalling. Have you ever talked to someone and just ignore you? Have you ever asked something and they just didn't respond to you or they just walked away? That's stonewalling. Now, stonewalling is a third, and the last one is called defensiveness. And these are the four things that actually he, in his study of 40 years, that he had a, rela a couple met, uh, couple's lab in US, and he found out these are the four things that actually destroys and fracture relationships. But in that, on the other side, he also gives us the four antidotes, which I won't cover today. I'll cover in the next time when I come back to CMC. So, you know, he talks about the four hospitals, and this is what I want to focus in today. Because as believers, even though we are born again, I believe there are times when, you know, we encounter people at work, at home. You know, when someone forgot to switch off the light again. <laughs> or someone did, left their dirty clothes on the floor. Or they forgot to wash the dishes. You know, sometimes it, it irritates us. And so in those times, you know, what do we do? You know, is that, could it be that what we are missing, the first step, it's not to just love, but it's to first receive God's love for ourselves. You know, today God wants to give us the antidote to build a sound relationship house at home, you know, so that you can strengthen your relationship with your spouse. Max Lucado in his book called A Love Worth giving has this to say it's a very good book you can read it you can go and get it in the next slide it says this you give love by first receiving love you be you give love by first receiving it what does it mean it means that we on our own in john chapter our uh, first john chapter 4 verse 19 it says that we love because god first loved us as humans as people fallen it's difficult sometimes, you know, when to love others when we have been misunderstood, hurt or betrayed. And today I want to share with you three simple truths about how we can be caught by love to love differently. So three points. The first one is knowing a God who loves. Secondly, is to consider how much we are loved. And third, to abide in God's love. Now let's look at point number one, knowing a God who loves. In the book of 1 John chapter 1, verse 4 and 7, it says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Now the word born in Greek means genoa, which means an impartation of spiritual life, for one who is formerly dead in trespasses and sin. All of us here, when you're born again, you have the God's genetic makeup. We are inherited because God made us in His likeness. And when God made us in His likeness, God created us for fellowship. You know, the most miserable person on earth is a person without a friend or someone that he can relate with. Good relationships occur when love connects us and needs our heart together. But some of you may ask me, how can we be patient with those who have the warmth of a voucher and tenderness of a porcupine? Try loving a porcupine. It is hard, isn't it? And you know, for us, you know, when, when we work in the, for me, being the social services, we serve, the, we serve those who we need. But sometimes when we serve others, we do get uh, some words that may be said about us or said to us. But it's not because of, of me or because of us, but sometimes I have to frame it, God, help me love those that may be having a difficult time. Now, how do we, how can we love and be kind to those who are unkind to us? How can we forgive those who backstab or betrayed us? Today, perhaps you want to, 
but you don't know how you can. And the answer is found here, to, to know and be born again. The way is to first know the God who loves you. To receive God's love for yourself. Now I want you to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4 and 8 in the next slide. You know, it says this, If I were to pause here and I ask you to substitute and put your name inside, meaning, Elin is patient, Elin is kind, Elin does not envy. Try and do this exercise with me. Put your name inside this passage and ask yourself, are you always patient? Are you always kind? Do you not envy? Do you boast? Are you proud? Are you rude? Are you self-seeking? Are you easily angered? Do you keep records of wrong? Do you not delight in evil but rejoice in truth? Do you always protect, always trust, always hope, always persevere? Do you always never fail? When you look at all these, you realize like I did, that hey, I can't do all of the above. So the only way is to first, instead of being remembered of a love we cannot produce, let it remind us of a love that we cannot resist and that is God's love. Now the secret of God's love is to know that, you know, Jesus is patient, Jesus is kind. It's, and some of you, when you're sitting here, you, are, you, need to, you want to experience that love from God. Perhaps you have not experienced that. You know, but today, God loves you. And He wants you to experience what it's like to be born again in His love. Because He loves you with unfailing love. And He wants to fill your heart today and be born again. Now, that's the first thing. The second thing is after we know that, that on our own we are incapable, we can't, we have limitations. The second part we need to come to is how do we, we need to consider how much we are loved. First John chapter 4, verse 9 and 10, he says this, In this the love of God was manifested towards us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that He's loved us and sent His Son to be a propitiation for our sins. Now the secret to loving is first found in receiving God's love for yourself. Because the word, Greek word for propitiation is helismo. It means to appease God's wrath on account of sin. And so when God's wrath is appeased, we who sin against Him will not get what we deserve. Now I want to do a very simple demonstration. I'm going to ask VC, okay, and brother... Elder v Billy, and I'm going to be the, the, the sinner, okay? So imagine VC is God. He is Jesus. You can stand here, okay? And, and, and I'm the, the believer, the, the sinner sometimes. I make mistakes, and I'm imperfect. So imagine I have the, there's the three of us here. Now the Bible tells us that God, can you stand up here? When God sees me, when VC sees me, he will look at me and say, wow, this person has a lot of imperfections. Yes, maybe I have uh, done this wrong, I said this wrongly, and maybe I didn't comb my hair this morning. So he began to look at and think about all the imperfections that I may have. Right, and that is when, but God in His great love, what did He do? Did He just see all my imperfections? He sent His Son, Jesus, which is Elder Billy, here, that when He looks at me, He will first see what Jesus had done. And what did Jesus do? He died on a cross to forgive all my sins so that I'm born again. I'm washed by the blood of Christ. Isn't it? And when he, God sees me, no longer does He see my imperfection, but essentially Jesus has come to stand the gap to, so that I can be forgiven and I can receive God's love freely for myself. And so the only way, okay, give them a hand, shall we? So what have I just demonstrated is this, that because of that, when we, God calls us to love others, and there are times when we, we find it difficult, but instead of forcing, but why not come to God and say, God, I need to be born again. I need to see others as how Jesus, you see them. I need to see them not through my own human eyes, through my own human limitations, my own human efforts. But let me see them as how you would see them. 
And this is what God wants us to do. Now, and, and you know, he who forgives has been forgiven the most, loved the most. You know, in Luke chapter 7, verse 41 to 47, if you can turn your, your Bibles, you know, what happened in this passage? It talks about how uh, Jesus taught a Pharisee by the name of Simon a pertinent truth about love. What happens is that Simon invited Jesus into his house but treated him like an unwanted guest. There was no courtesy, no kiss or greetings, no washing of feet, no oil for his head. In modern terms, it says no one opened the door. Imagine you invite someone over to your house, you didn't open the door, you didn't take his coat, you didn't even shake his hands. That's what Simon did. No customary greeting. But look at what the woman did. You know, the woman said in verse 41, it says that, uh, it, oh, sorry, in earlier ver- passage, you know, it says in verse 38, what she did, she stood at his, beh- at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with her hair on her head. And she kissed the feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. So you imagine with me that this lady, a sinner, You know, maybe it could be a prostitute. She was not invited. She was despised. But when she came to Jesus, she placed her face to his feet. There was still dusty from the streets. She used her tears and her hair to bathe the feet of Jesus as she took perfume and massaged it into his feet. Many of us would have thought, that perhaps Simon should be the one to show the love, as after all, he's the host. He is the one who invited Jesus to his house. But yet, the woman out did all the above. And that's why Jesus taught him in verse 47, he says, he says this, that, Therefore I say to you, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she has loved much. Her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she has been loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same love little. You see, this woman came thirsty from guilt, from regret. And when Jesus gave her the hand of grace, she drank that all up. But Simon, on the other hand, he doesn't even know he's thirsty you know, it's, it wasn't that Simon couldn't be forgiven. He just never asked to be. And so what it tells us is that we cannot give what we have not experienced for ourselves. If we have not received love from God, we may find it, it'll be difficult, but it's not pos- impossible. But you know, we need to receive God's love to love others. If you want to learn to forgive, consider how God has forgiven you. Finding hard to put others first, then consider how Jesus put you first, even though when he was God. If you need more patience, drink from the patience of God. If you have troubles with your ungrateful children or cranky neighbors, then consider how God put up with us. And so when we receive God's love for us, you know, that is when God gives us the ability, a transfusion, it's like blood transfusion, to love others. Now, lastly, we, need, we can abide in God's love. It says this, that no one has seen God at any time. But if we love one another, God abides in us, and His love has been perfected in us. By this, we know that if we abide in Him and Him in us, because He has given us His Spirit. Now, what does the word abide mean? The word abide in Greek means meno. It means to remain, to stay, to take permanent residence, or to make yourself at home. So when we abide in God's word, it comes to the word mano, it means habitation. We allow ourselves to be inhabited, stay in God's presence. And when we do that, God is love. When we abide in in God, we abide in God's love. And this is where the word teleo, which is perfect, it means that we are then made perfect. We are made complete. So this is where... This is the way that God used us and how He pours His love in us so that we can be perfect when we love our brothers and sisters. You know, I want to share with you, you know, it says that um, in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17, it says that Christ may 
dwell in our hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love. Now I have with me this, a, this sheet of paper and this is what I'm going to do. What does abiding look like? So I have this a, 4A4 sheet of paper and when you think about the word abide, let's look at the word. It says that I need to dwell, I need to stand. In the, it's called a circle, I like to call it the circle of God's love or the circle of security. Romans chapter 8 tells us that, what does it tell us? Is that who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, persecution or famine, nakedness or perils or sword? For as written, for your sake we were killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, angels nor principalities or powers, neither things present nor things to come, neither height nor depth, or any created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now how is, are we not then, not, we don't allow the circumstance to separate us from God's love? It's to stay in this circle. Because there will be situations in your life There'll be events, episodes at home where people will make a comment, give you a look, say something. It can be what John Gottman said, the four horsemen criticize you, stonewall you, treat you with contempt, or you're defensive towards you. And when we experience all of these, our natural response, our human response is what I call I fight, flight or freeze, isn't it? You know, the human brain is made of the, what you call, I, I, I teach some of my parents like what you call the reptilian brain. No reptilian brain is what you call the acne down. When you are born, when a baby is born in the world, what's the first thing that baby does? Cries. Yes, all the mummies can tell me, the daddies too. And when they cry, why? Because, and then we know the louder they cry, the healthier they are. Because that's the acne doll, that's the dinosaur, the reptilian brain that is, they have. And that allows the child, the baby to survive. But what happens is this, but when we, are, when we face a threat, like the four horsemen that John Gothman tells us, our response is three things, the three Fs. We will fight, we can step out of the circle and we fight. I may step out of this circle to run away, to flight. Or I may just freeze. I don't know how to respond. So that is a very normal human response. But what this by what the passage tells us, what God tells us, instead of doing the fight, flight, freeze, we are to remain. To be rooted in God's love. It means I stay in this circle of security. And God will continue to pour out His love, His presence, His forgiveness. He's healing in our hearts and in our soul as long as we stay in this circle of security. And that's why God allows us, He says, when I'm weak, God is strong. When I can't forgive, God will pour out the healing in my heart to forgive those around us. And so this is why Ephesians, uh, Jude chapter 21 uh, Job chapter 1, there's only one chapter. Job chapter uh, verse 21 and 24, it says, Keep yourself in the love of God, looking for mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And on some having compassion, making a distinction, but all others safe with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even every garment devout by flesh. But I want to highlight 24. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling keep you from starting to present you faultless before the presence of this glory with exceeding joy. It means we need to keep ourselves close to God. Abide in the circle of security. You know, as a mother, when my son, I have two boys, my eldest son is 16 now and my younger is uh, 12 years old. I remember when my son was very young, about two plus, uh, three years old, I brought him swimming. And you know, as uh, kids, when they go swimming, they, oh, they're so happy with water. They just want to play, right? And then as a parent, you know, I see that, oh, you know, he's, he's waddling, but the pool gets deeper and deeper and deeper. So I tell my son, hey, no, 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 don't go there. But you know, kids, they just, oh, water, you know, they just want to jump in and play. 
And so I, I noticed that there was a step there, but he didn't see it. But I saw it because I'm taller than he was. And so I decided to stay close by him. And true enough, he took a step in and he went in. But because I'm his mother, I was nearby, what I do is I reach out my hands, I grabbed him and pulled him up. And that's the security and the safety that God gives to us. The Bible tells us, though he stumble, he will not fall. For God will rescue him by his right hand. And though you may stumble, you may trip. People may trip you. People may say things or hurt you or sit or don't do anything. Just ignore you. But if we were to say, I will stay and abide in the circle of God's love and security, God will refresh you. God will heal you. God will renew you and still give you the capacity to love. I want to close by sharing a, a, um, later on a grounding, I'll share a grounding exercise. And later I want to share a, a testimony of my own life when I was growing up. You know, how do we then keep ourselves in God's love? I share with you a very simple grounding exercise. You know, we use this, um, this is something that I, I've learned from someone. And we use that whenever there is a disaster, war, you know, when people experience a crisis, you know, it could be an earthquake, a natural disaster, uh, a, a, a situation. It's called a grounding method. Now, what is a grounding method? I contextualize it into the Christian context. Okay, the, the secular, the psych, um, grounding method is what I call a 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 method. Five stands for five things that you see. That's what we do in, um, in, in some of our work. Five things that you see so that you can calm down. You know, have you ever want, been in a situation when somebody said something to you, did something or didn't do something and you got very worked up and upset? Yes? Yes, I see people nodding head. Uh. I'm not the only one, right? You get very upset. You're a Christian, right? Now, I saw a pastor. Uh. Oh, you know, I see I have patient. You know, I have to be calm. You know, I get all very upset. And my natural re response is, I want to fight with you. I want to run away from you. Or I just stand there thinking, how am I supposed to respond to you, right? But this is a very simple grounding exercise that you can try this out. What I do is, I just stand there. When I feel very anxious, I feel that I'm getting very stressed out. I just look around me and see, what are the five things I see? But here in a Christian country, what are the five things that showcase God is with me? It can be a cloud. You can look up in the sky and see the clouds, the birds, the rainbow, the sun. The four things that I touch to know that I'm still alive. And sometimes, you know, medical emergency, sometimes people feel like, oh, I'm having, uh, like, I don't feel so good, something's going to happen. Very simply is you focus in on your present, you touch your, your leg, your, clo your cloth on your sh pants, your shirt. The you know, four things that you touch or the bag I'm holding on to, the phone I'm holding on to, what does it feel like? So that's the ground. You, how does it feel like? What do I, what's my, the sensation on my fingers? Now, three things, three things that I hear that God is with me. You can play a music. It could be the birds, the wind, the sound of birds or wind, you know, and the smell, the smell of grass, the smell of sea, food from the kitchen. Okay, things that, re, that tells you that I'm okay. And lastly is, what is one thing that God is telling me today? What is one word? What is one reminder or experience that I had before with God that I know that God is still with me? So when we ground ourselves, we abide in God's presence. We stay in God's presence and you can do the 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 exercise. What are the five things I see? I read the Bible that tells me about God's love. What are the things I see around me that showcase God's glory and God's presence is with me? What do I hear? What Christian music do I hear? And so you can do the exercise. And when we begin to ground myself, we are rooted in God's love. And this is where He will give us the capacity to respond in a way that is loving. In a way that shows love for the people around me. And so, you know, it says Matthew chapter 5, verse 46. Is, it says that if you love those who love you, uh, what reward would you get? Are you not even, even not the tax collectors are doing that? 
So, and if you greet your only your own people, what are you doing? What are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. But be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Well, that's a very tall order, isn't it? We are to be perfect. Now, the only way we can do it is to abide in God's love. The one who has perfect love. And so, in conclusion, I just want to share about calluses. Now, how many of you have calluses on your feet? Yes, I'm sure many of you have. It could be on your hands. I have one on my finger because of all the writing I do. You know, we can have calluses on your hands and your feet. And calluses are formed because they are, when there's friction, your skin will pro begin to form thick, hardened layers of skin because your skin is trying to protect itself from friction or pressure or from pain. Now, the way to remove calluses you know, that some of you are familiar with, you go for pedicure, manicure, is to soak them in hot water. Then they will uh, rub the, the thin, the thickened skin. They use compact and then they moisturize. So a very normal process to remove calluses. Now today, I want to share with you what the God's, God's Word say about calluses. It says in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26, it goes like this. I will put I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take away the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a, a stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. You know, some of us here, when we're sitting here, you may have calluses around your heart because of what you have experienced in life. But today, God wants to, as you come to God's presence in a moment's time, I'm going to invite the musicians to come. You know, God is calling you to abide and begin to take just the next few minutes before you leave this place to just soak in God's presence, in God's love and say, God, today I want to receive your love for me so that all the calluses that I have around my heart because of maybe what my father said, my mother said, my wife said, my husband said or my children did will melt away that I can have a heart that loves them. You know, when I was growing up, you know, I, I did not have a, uh, because of some, um, I was a very naughty child. Okay, I'm a middle child. I have an elder sister who's 18 months older, a younger brother who's very brilliant. You know, he's a, he's a, he's a maxillofacial surgeon. He's very brilliant. And so as a middle child, you know, I was not very smart with academics, but I was smart with getting a, out of trouble, if you know what I mean. And so my mother had a hard time, you know, and, you know, every time she would scratch her head and think, you know, how am I going to correct her, discipline her in, you know, so that she will be, behave and she will study, right? And so what happened is that, you know, because of that, you know, over the years, you know, she was, she was anxious. And so there are times, you know, when I experienced, you know, her, her frustration because she was, you know, stressed out and frustrated. Uh, but because of that, for many years, you know, I had this callous in my heart. I have a callus that developed because I was afraid of being disciplined for my misbehavior, my naughtiness, my mischief. And I began to form calluses. And as I was growing up, you know, when I experienced friendship and re relationship at work, you know, with my friends, and people would say things, do things, you know, I, and the calluses began to form. It was not until one time when, you know, I was in a service and God, he didn't ask me to love them because I said, well, God loved very hard, you know. But it's when during a service when I was in, God, in a service hall and God just opened a bucket. He poured out his bucket of love and washed away all the calluses that I formed over the years. Calluses towards my family, towards even sometimes, you know, things that people say or people do. And today, you know, if you are here and you know that your life and how you relate with others sometimes could be with mistrust, suspicion, with defensiveness, with stonewalling, you know, God wants to heal you. He wants you to, as you abide in Him, He wants to be able to soak and soften the calluses so that He can fold it away, so that He can make your heart into a heart of flesh again. So let's pray, shall we, even as we, as we bow for a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for this time that you gathered us together to be in your presence. As we go into this month where we look at the families, 
and relationships at home. I thank you, God, that you know you're speaking to us because there are different ones in this hall that maybe have had a misunderstanding or experienced a hurt or this rejection or pain through a relationship. It could have been a misunderstanding. It could be something that was unintended, that was unforeseen, but yet there's this wound and this hurt that they have kept in their hearts. But this morning as we come to you in your presence, I ask, oh God, that you begin to pour out your spirit into their hearts, that you will heal them of that hurt, of that disappointment, that rejection or bitterness. And if that's you this morning and, and God is speaking to you and say, you know, that's me. You know, God has been speaking to me about, you know, relating with someone or my family member. But for a long time, I've been very careful, cautious, and yet I've avoided the interaction. But today, God is speaking to you and say, come and let Him pour His love and let Him take away the calluses in your heart so that you can receive His love and His healing and His forgiveness that you can extend it to others. And if that's you this morning, just lift out your hands and then put it down because I want to include you in this prayer. Thank you for your hand. Is there anyone else? If that's you, yes, I thank you for your hand. Thank you for raising the hand to God. Is there anyone here that God is speaking to you? No one looking around, every head bowed and every eye closed. No one looking around and God is speaking to you about that. Is there anyone else? Yes, I see your hand. Thank you. Thank you for your hand. You know, there's a relationship. Yes, thank you for your hand. There's a relationship that you have been wounded. It could be an in-law. You know, I, I, I just think of the word, the in-law relationship. It could be a hurtful word. It could be a thoughtless, something that was basically set off not, without much thought and it has wounded you and made you doubt yourself. And today, God is calling you to reach out to the person and if you are here today, you lift up your hand right now. This, this, thank you for your hand. Thank you. You know, there could be a fracture in your relationship. And some of you here, I sense there's this uh, children, teenagers. You may have adult children, teenagers, young adults. You know, for, for some reasons, because you have wanted things to be done a certain way, it has caused fracture and freezes in the relationship. And your prayer today is, God, I want to see my relationship with my children, my, my, those that I care for, restored and healed. You want to see the healing and repair. And if that's you, you lift up your hands. Yes, I see that hand lift up, hands going up. Thank you for your hand. You know, I'm going to pray and then I'm going to invite you to the front and then we want to spend the next maybe five to ten minutes just ministering to you because I believe that God's presence is here and He wants to be able to pour His love into your heart to, to soak so that you can soak in God's presence and let Him melt the calluses in your heart that the indifference that you have been carrying with you for a long time. Father, I pray for all my brothers and sisters. You see those hands that are lifted to you this morning. I ask, Holy Spirit, that you come into our midst and into this presence. That you do that work in our, in our midst this day. Because as you have said, you will give them, you will remove a heart of stone and you give them a heart of flesh. And we commit this time of prayer into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we all stand in God's presence? And this is what we're going to do is, I'm going to invite those who raise their hands to just come out. You, know, you can come with your spouse, you can come with your friend. But let's make this time a time of prayer, shall we? Just come up and say, God, today I want to just be in your presence. I want to be able to soak in your presence and your love so that all the, the feelings of hurt, of frustration, of regret, of unforgiveness, that you can melt them all away this morning. If you're here as brother will lead us into a worship song, I'm going to invite you to come up so we can, we can pray along with you.